um, people that are familiar with my research program knows that I've been studying postsynaptic proteins for about 30 years primarily glutamate receptors and in particular NMDA receptors, but also scaffolding molecules, adhesion molecules, et cetera. And it was really with the advent of um, the faster and more efficient sequencing of patient populations that it became clear that a lot of the proteins I've been studying for a couple of decades are actually implicated in neurodevelopmental disorders. And in particular, um, we've been studying GRIN2A and GRIN2B or the protein names glue into a and glue into b for, for many years. But with the sequencing, you, you can look in sites like Safari and you see it's in the highest confidence level. As evidenced by this meeting, more and more people are being di diagnosed. So um, everyone at this meeting, I imagine, knows that um, NMDA receptors are heterotetramers. I still want to show this slide because what I point out on this slide is this thing here that's often lopped off in the other structural that, that is you know, deemed not worthy of even showing. We focus a lot of our attention on the C-terminal domains. Um, NMDA receptors or heterotetramers, each of the subunits has a topology. And it, in, in particular for 2A and 2B, the C-terminal domains are big. They're like 600 amino acids. And we focused our attention on this for many years. Now, um, a lot of the rare variants that are in, um, diagnosed Patients with Grin disorders have diagnosed the rare variants or affect channel properties. Um, this area is more likely to affect trafficking. The C termini we know are important. There's no debate about that, I don't think, because um, the, um, Seberg's lab many, many years ago showed that the knock ins lacking the tail phenocopy the knock outs. So, for example, um, glue in 2B, if you knock it out, the animals aren't viable. If you knock it in without the tail, they're not viable. So, so that's my pitch that the C-term and I are important and they regulate all sorts of processes, both um, trafficking to the cell surface, lateral mobility, capture at synapse, synapses, endocytosis and exocytosis. So the C-terminal domain has protein-protein interaction sites, and also um, post-translational modification, you know, residues that are hit by phosphorylation in particular, we study that. So um, from this very basic perspective, I was this card-carrying basic scientist, rather stubborn about it for most of my career. And in particular, we'd studied 2A and 2B when I started my own lab over 20 years ago and focused very much on this, this short little stretch of 2B. Um, this is an important part of the this very large C-terminal domain. And we know that because it has these two motifs that are very close together. There's the ESBV motif that binds to PSC95. And there's this tyrosine-based endocytic motif which binds to AP2 adapters and drives endocytosis. So these two motifs for the receptor are working at cross purposes. This stabilizes the receptor on the surface. So you get a lot of synaptic receptors. However, the tyrosine motif is working to, to um, internalize it and, and downregulate it. And these are both right regulated by phosphorylation. And so one thing that struck us through all these years of studying it is that the motifs are very highly conserved. Yet 2A, we would make these point mutations and they were almost inert. They had no, no effect. It was very frustrating because they were conserved. 2B, they had huge effects. You can have point mutations that make it synaptically dead, or you can have the synaptically dead mutation and do a, a tyrosine mutation on top of it and rescue it. So exquisite regulation in the short. So that's the basic science pitch of um, what we had been doing. We then began, um, actually it was through the undiagnosed disease program at NIH, connected us with Steve Trinalis, who I'd known for a long time, but I'd never collaborated with. And um, it's probably, I don't know, 10 years ago now when we started talking and I, from a very basic science perspective, thought maybe we could use human genetics to understand the C-terminal domain better. And then as more and more variants came up, then I got a little bit more ambitious that perhaps we can actually shed light on dysfunction and, and have avenues for, for therapeutics. That's the more ambitious version. Now, why do we think this? This group knows 2A and 2B are highly invariant. They're very intolerant to variation. And... Um, Therefore, like we all have different genes, so you know, there's variation in, the, in people's um, um, genetics. I mean, that's normal, but um, some genes tolerate, tolerate it really well. The prototypic one that people will discuss is like their olfactory receptors. They will tolerate a lot of variation, 2A and 2B do not. So that's consistent with them being incredibly important. 
and I take a lot of my slides from Steve Camelo too. I'm just doing this over here. But the um, um, this really, really caught my eye, and um, when it came out a few years ago, and basically this looks like a hydropathy plot, but it's not. It's so two A and two B are intolerant on average compared to other genes, meaning that they don't tolerate variation particularly well. But if you look at it cross functional domains, there's certain certain places that it crashes to zero, meaning that you don't find patients, humans walking around, for example, in the transmembrane domains. This would make sense. You wouldn't want to have a variant there. You can imagine that it would be catastrophic for the receptors to even um, oligomerize and get to the surface. Of course, what caught my eye was this. So 2B, the C terminal domains, first of all, full disclosure, they're much more tolerant to variation. So when we see a variant of um, unknown significance, sometimes they don't have an effect on our assays and sometimes they do. I think they have to be analyzed. But this right here, the fact that it crashes to zero with 2B in that region that we'd spent so long studying, felt like a lot of validation that indeed that, that region is incredibly sensitive to any sort of changes. So since then, we've been watching quite carefully the databases and both the unaffected NOMAD database and comparing it to ClinVar and Safari and the CFERV site and things like that to try to um, compare 2A and 2B. And um, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but as of now, there's no, we don't find in any database at all a missense mutation in these last 15 amino acids of 2B. That these black asterisks, this is from Nomad, you do with 2A. So, very much in line with my basic research from a long time ago. So, that, that was interesting, but we thought we could also use the human variation to learn about synaptic dysfunction with disease, but also probe a little bit of the structure function, because as you know from the structural um, pictures, there's no structure at the C terminal. So, what I'm going to do is tell you just Three examples, one of them is just one slide, and the other ones are, are a bit longer. Three examples of how we're, in, we went from like having variants, like, oh, we really wanna study this variant. Now there's so many. It's like, how do we pick and choose what could be the most beneficial to the field and to patient populations and also revealing of structure function. So that's kind of where we are. So the first one, I'm just gonna show the one slide because it feeds into what my kind of intro and that's that we have collaborations going on with GeneDX, a former postdoc works there. I'm sure some of you in the audience do as well. And, um, and for this one, we, they have two patients that in their databases, these are not published, that have variants that res, um, result in an extension, which I find completely fascinating. So the last 15 amino acids of 2B are completely intact. But these particular variants result in either one or seven amino acid extension. We started doing some experiments. It's not ready. It's not a complete story. But as you can imagine, this is going to disrupt binding. We've shown that with PSD95 and SAP102. Um, the obligatory slide won't go on. That's tech. Can you? It's not going. Okay, so um, so we had just kind of given up on 2A. We had spent a lot of time and effort on 2A through the years. And as I said, these mutations that seemed like they should have a big effect didn't. And so we were just kind of like, you know, we kind of had it. But because of the human genetics, we then decided to kind of revisit this because once again, we can use this comparison. So in the last 15 amino acids, um, there are some residues that are in Nomad or the unaffected population. There's one that Marta Vieira, super talented fellow that really led all of this in the lab for many years. She um, decided to look at the serine and it was in ClinVar and it was not in the Nomad database. And she ended up doing, this was actually published during COVID. Um, well, this is, this is the introduction, but she, um, she found this in ClinVar. It's a single missense mutation. So it's one patient we don't have, we don't know the patient. Um, if it ends up popping up where someone would know who this patient is, we'd love to make contact. We still thought it was worth looking at because of a couple of things. This particular serine is in a part of this extreme C terminal domain that had been shown using structural studies, been predicted to affect binding to sorting nexons. This is a structural study. 
And um, so that was predicted. Also, there was quite a few studies of phosphoproteomics. So identifying 1459 as being a phosphorylation site on 2A, but they didn't know the kinase. And so for those reasons, we decided to, to we, we meaning Marta, decided to follow up on this. And what we found was pretty interesting. We tried different kinases. It turned out it's a CAMK2 site, which once again was a surprise to me because people have been working on CAMK2 and 2B for decades. And this is, had not been reported to our knowledge in 2A. So this is the extreme tail. Um, this is an in vitro phosphorylation by CAMP2. It's phosphorylated, a single point mutation disrupts it. We can make mutations and look at binding. And indeed, when we mimic phosphorylation of this particular residue, it enhances binding to sorting nexin, which is a trafficking molecule. This had been predicted structurally. And it disrupts binding. To, this is a co-IP assay, you disrupt binding to SP95. This one residue, by either mimicking phos, you know, being phosphorylated, being unphosphorylated, can dictate the binding to stabilizing protein, stay on the surface, or a trafficking molecule and increase recycling in the cytosis. Um, we also made a phosphoantibody, and this is this is published. And um, but just to give you an idea, of some of the things we do in the lab. In this case, what we do is we use normal. Um, Rodents, we expose them, to, we dark rear them, expose them to light, take out the visual cortex, do biochemistry. What you can see is that there's an increase here when they're dark reared. For, I mean, it, there's an increase when you expose them to light. Anyway, it's, it's an in vivo activity assay. So this, this residue. So um, I'm not going to take you through all the data, but 2A is phosphorylated by CAMP2. Um, we, the only reason we looked at it was because it was in this in ClinVar, and we ended up um, characterizing this, this regulation. Um, we, we showed this phosphorylated in vivo and that phosphorylation can dictate the binding. Um, and, it, it, and I didn't show the data, but it actually decreases spine density and decreases surface expression. We've done quite a few variants in the tail. The, the next story is an exception. In general, these variants, if they have a phenotype, they're, they're loss of function. They tend to have less of the synapse, less of the sur surface, fewer spines. But what about the actual variant? The variant is actually a serine to glycine. And it actually disrupts, these are just the graphs to show, it disrupts binding the co-IP of both sorting necks and PSC95. So this mutation doesn't really, act, you know, it's not a null phospho mutation and it's not a phosphomimic, it's, it's different altogether and, and disrupts both. And indeed, this one has fewer spines and fewer, fewer. Um, this is dispersed culture. We express a wild type or mutant, and you see that there's less on the surface. We also do spine morphology, fill, and look at spine number and density, and there's a decrease. So I went through that kind of quickly. I would say that this is, um, like I said, the variants where we found effects, um, when we do find effects, they tend to be loss of function and less receptors at the surface and at the synapse. So, um, yeah. So the last part I'm gonna talk about, this is unpublished, but it's kind of, as I said, it's kind of the exception that proves the rule. It has a, this has a very mixed um, phenotype. So it was, it was kind of intriguing. This, is, this was a parent that contacted me directly um, a couple of years ago. It takes a long time to do these studies. And their child has a variant in 2A in the C-terminal domain. It's a frame shift. A, and what you end up with is you miss, you lose about half the C-tail, but you also get a stretch of anomalous amino acids because, um, because of this frame shift. So it's kind of an unusual one. We decided to go ahead and study this because it, almost the entire C-terminal domain, even though it's big, is in last exon. So we thought it was... Uh, safe enough to actually study a truncation and in, in, in in frame shift. So it's one patient and it, what we're writing up as a case study with um, epilepsy variant and associated developmental delay. So from the um, molecular point of view, um, Marta ran through the um, like in silico, like you know, just to see what, what's predicted to bind to it. And I kind of thought this, when she told me she did this, I'm like, 
you're not really gonna I mean, basically the full length is gonna apply to every PSC domain, I mean, PDC domain containing protein there is. That's what we, you would predict. And you're gonna cut that off and they're all gonna go away. But she actually found something really interesting. And that's that this anomalous stretch of amino acids ends in a motif and it, you know, it just happens in a motif that retains binding to scribble. Scribble is a, a PDZ domain containing protein that had already been shown to interact with um, gluin 2A and to promote recycling. So that was quite interesting to us. Um, and she actually, Marta did experiments comparing the wild type and the frame shift which is going to migrate smaller because it's shorter protein and do co-IPs. And as you, as you would imagine, you lose binding to PSD95 and to SAP102, but you actually get enhanced binding to scribble. Um, I'm not going to show you all the data from this. I'll show you some of the highlights. Basically, she replicated the, the, the literature, the scribble, this, this PDZ protein can enhance recycling of 2A. We replicated that very nicely. And she also showed that the variant does as well. So the, the retained binding does have an effect on both the, the mutant and the wild type. Um, she actually saw an increase in surface expression. This is the only C-terminal variant that we've worked on thus far that shows an increase. But um, it shows less spines. And what we found is that there's an increase in surface expression, but it's selectively at extra synaptic sites. So if you measure the synaptic localization, it's unchanged between the wild type and the mutant. Um, there is a, there are fewer spines. It's not any particular. We we do we use neurolucida and imaging and count spines and also look at the different types. There's no it was no specific type. But you see a reduction. And um, we also have done other studies with this. And like I said, we've done the imaging, we collaborate. On all of these, we collaborate with Steve um, Trinalis. And as you would expect, you don't have big effects from the biophysics or the pharmacological properties. They, the, all these variants that I'm showing you tend to be trafficking and effects in localization. We also collaborate with Wei Lu at NINDS. And when we see fewer spines, and we collaborate with him, they see like fewer minis, amphiminis consistent with fewer synapses. So that's just kind of a blanket statement because that's been quite consistent. So anyway, we have this frame shift that's mistargeted. It's rather unusual phenotype. Um, it reduces binding to PSD95, but it can serve to scribble. And it has increased surface expression, but selectively at extra synaptic sites. And for whatever reason, this mistargeting and this change in coupling to, to um, downstream signaling results in, in fewer spines, fewer synapses. So in the last couple minutes, I'm kind of going through this. I don't know, I have a few minutes. Um, I want to talk about, and it was alluded to in this one of the sessions today about how hard it is to get um, reproducible models, especially when we want to use iPSCs. And that's really where we want to go is to start using human neurons. That are, I mean, you know, human cells are differentiated in neurons. And so it's under the endogenous promoter, and we can knock in using CRISPR the mutants and compare um, controls. I mean, that would be our goal, and that's what we're trying to do. There's some real problems with this, so I just kind of want to pitch this out there as um, something that would be great if we could tackle as a community, and that's that there's so much variation. One of the more common differentiation techniques is the one-step protocol, where they use NGN2. This is quite popular to um, differentiate the excitatory neurons. However, in the different, it's already reported in the literature, they don't express NMDA receptors. That's a problem. You know, study NMDA receptors. So, um, and we've shown that in our own lab, we've used that rapid protocol to study neuroligands that are expressed really well in those. However, um, we we've done it ourselves, and we don't see in-house NMDA receptors. So, what we've done instead is try to come up with a longer protocol, say who's in the audience, my staff scientists. Beautiful work, it's very tedious, trying to get this reproducible expression. And what seems to be key, he went to this previously published paper, is you need to have this multi-step process. It's important to have the mixed cultures. You just do the one factor and kind of push it through to excitatory neurons, you're, you're missing something. Um, you need the embryonic bodies or the rosettes seem to be an important intermediate. 
And in this particular paper, they show that there's the NMDA receptors expressed. Say him, there he is, there he is. He, um, <laughs> there he is. He, um, he's done this and it took him a long time and he's gotten really nice expression of NMDA receptors, but it's not trivial and it takes time. And as he explains it, if anyone has questions, you would have to ask him because it's kind of like, we make the embryonic bodies, and they have to float, and they have to expand, and then they have to attach, and then they have to expand, and then you have to scrape. You know, it's this very multi-step process. And even when he follows the protocol exactly that said they got NMDA receptors and he gets NMDA receptors, he had this problem where it wasn't, they weren't expanding at this one time point. This is a, you know, a multi-month process. And, um, and he had to replace it. He found a replacement that works for him. But my point is like, even using the exact protocol, we've had to tweak it. So I just think um, that, I believe that this is where we should be going, but I don't think it's trivial. I think that the more the different labs can share their techniques and their protocols so that we can standardize it, I, I certainly would appreciate that. Oh, I, so I was trying to get back. I just went past the whole lab. Anyway, this is Marta. She's done the vast majority of the, of the, of the work on the variants. She's not in the lab anymore. She was a superstar. Oh, there, it did go back. So the, um, <laughs> right, So because we took this like right before she was leaving because she's like, I shouldn't get in. And I'm like, well, you have to get in this one of the pictures. So this is the current group. Um, at this meeting, we have Hei Young and Sei Hoon. They're the NMDA receptor team working on the Grin variants. And um, the, uh, Marta's trying to like finish writing up some of the stuff that she had been working on and um, she's back in Portugal. And I think I've mentioned all the collaborators. Yep. She, she is our contact with Gene DX and it's been fa fabulous. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Roche. All right, we'll open the floor to questions. Please raise. Hi, Catherine. Uh, so I know the work from um, Toronto, they got some good NMDA receptor expression in IPSCs. I think it was the Brennan protocol. Yeah, so you know that paper. It's Mike Salter, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're familiar with that. And if you talk to them, I mean, first of all, they're longer, like the NGN2, you get it faster. So his protocol, if you use NGO2 and you wait longer, I mean, NGN2 does a really rapid differentiation. But to get the NMDA receptors, you have to culture them a long time, and it's not so reliable. And that, I mean, we talked to Mike about it. And so I think it's in the paper. Like sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. It's just kind of the state of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, um, it's not trafficking, but I'm still, um, maybe you have some um, experience also in that space. So um, everyone is talking about um, rare variants of large effect, right? Um, but there's a lot of GWAS signal around the NMDA receptor genes, in particular psychiatric disorders. Yeah, um, right. and, and so it's, it's clear that the haplotype um, influences the expression of the gene. It's, it's unclear how. Um, are you looking into this or are you aware about someone looking into this? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the short answer is like, no, like I'm, I'm not specifically looking into it. Am I aware of it? Yes, that it's, an, you know, I mean, a lot of these things, right? There's gonna be multiple hits, right? Or there's gonna be other, you know, we were doing some stuff on shank and some of the patients have a hit in shank entry or shank and, you know, so there's gonna be um, different variation that would affect this. And I know the Broad Institute, um, Ben, ben Mueller, he gives a talk that'd be like, you know, two Bs neurodevelopmental and two A's schizophrenia. And I think that's an oversimplification, but certainly, the the um, evidence for Grin two A and schizophrenia has spiked way up to where they think I think the geneticists say that in some cases they do think it can be monogenic I think which is kind of shocking to me no see I kind of don't like that either <laughs> like I've been like the, and 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 also flu A three has spiked to the top in the most recent and it's on the X chromosome I don't know, is anyone here studying is anyone at this meeting with three A three Dr. Byatt spoke earlier. He's working on 303. Uh, yeah, he's in there. This talk's recorded. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, never mind. The, um, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? 
All right, if everybody could welcome me and thank me, thanking Dr. Rubenstein.